The OSI model is bullshit. Someone asked me to do a video on the OSI model. And if you don't know what the OSI model is, it's something that they teach you at the beginning of networking, which I think should be taught at the end of networking. So what we're actually going to do first is level set. Let's talk about the internet. How is this video getting to you? Let's start with that. The internet is a series of tubes connecting things in some way. And that may sound like a really vague definition of the internet, but that's as specific as I can get. These are things because they could be computers, servers, washing machines, cable modems, set-top boxes, 9.1 million devices that run Java. These lines can be copper wire, fiber optics, radio wave, mesh network, Bluetooth, pretty much anything. And these things can be connected pretty much any way, and they can be connected in multiple places to each other. Now in reality, all of this is owned by different people. You know, this is AT&T, this is Comcast, this is Verizon, this is all kinds of other people. And the entire point of connecting all of these things together is to move data. Everything we do on the internet somehow boils down to data moving from one place to another over the network. The internet is relative. Let's say I have a desktop computer and I plug an ethernet cable into it and plug the other end into my mom's laptop. And now I can play Counter-Strike with her and we can share files and printers and I can run a web server and she can browse to it. But that's not the internet. And you wouldn't call it the internet. And if I connected you to that with an ad hoc wireless network, you would be able to do all those things, but it still wouldn't be the internet. But if I was connected to 4G and I was sharing my connection out, and now suddenly you're able to get to the internet. In your home, let's say you have two computers, a printer, and some other system, internet system, maybe it's an Xbox on a network. Uh, this would be called a LAN. These are all connected on one, what's called a broadcast domain. If one of them shouts, they can all hear it. You probably have a router that is connected to your ISP. Who gives a shit what that is? So we draw them with a cloud. A cloud represents some part of the equation you don't give a shit about. Typically other people's systems. When we draw a cloud with the I, that's the rest of the internet. Notice I didn't say the whole internet because you're now part of the internet. Let's say you live in an apartment and your neighbor has the same arrangement with a couple computers and you'd agree to share the internet. They have a router, you have a router. Well, you can connect their router to your router and now they are on the internet. This is a LAN and this is a LAN. And what you've created is a WAN. The things that move data on behalf of other things to other LANs are called routers. All of the things are nodes of the network, each have their own routing table, but we typically only call routers the things that forward packets on behalf of other things. One thing can be connected to the internet in multiple ways. Your phone's probably connected directly to your 4G network, and then you're also probably connected over wireless to an access point and a router, which is connected to your home internet. And any device like this is called multi-homing, and it needs to have a routing table to decide which gateway it's gonna use for which traffic. In complex networks, which is pretty much every place other than your home router, routers also have to make decisions in terms of multiple directions, multiple paths. The internet is relative. So routers on the internet can't possibly know about the entire internet. So they have something called a default route. And that's basically the direction they send everything they don't know about. So, in my example, this is my home network, and let's just say I have a couple more machines here. This is my router, and this is the internet. Its default route is out to the internet. So what's inside the cloud? More routers. Just a bigger, more complex series of routers. Your ISP aggregates all of their customers to a router in your local area, and then that connects to a larger upstream router. That potentially goes to a different provider that serves as a backbone. At each routing step, data can go multiple directions based on what that router wants to do with it. Every router is independent, except that some routers participate in something called BGP that lets them talk together in what's called an autonomous system. Think of it like a zip code. An AS number is like a zip code. All these routers just kind of know how to sort the traffic out. So at the edge of our network, we have these routers that connect us to other networks. But why is it that we can't just connect directly 
Why do we need routers for that? We don't need routers between the machines in our house, so why do we need the router between the machines in our house and the machines not in our house? Especially if all we're connecting to is just more routers. Well, when you're on a LAN, what that implies is that you're speaking directly to other people on that network. When you send traffic between A and B, there's nothing in between that's facilitating the direction of that traffic. You might have a device here connecting all the wires together, but that device is dumb to the type of addressing and routing that's happening on the internet. When these things are on the same LAN, they speak directly to each other, so they need to know who they're speaking to. That means that the larger the LAN gets, the more devices each device needs to know about. Think of it like people living in your house. At the very least, you need to know the nickname or first name of the people that are living in your house in order to address them, in order to refer to them. And you can think of the MAC address as like the first name of someone in your house. You kind of have to build a table of all the people you live with so you know who's there and who to talk to. And if someone talks to you, you kind of have to know who they are. If 32 people happen to live in your house, that means that every person that lives there knows the names of 31 other people. And that's a pain in the ass. No one should have to do that. Another reason why we route between lands is for flexibility, versatility, and redundancy. As we discussed, with this device that's tying everything together, it's really oblivious to how we want to shape the traffic and what the best route to someplace on the internet might be. Routers allow us to build complex networks that are not only geographically diverse, but also resilient and redundant. So if you're on a network over here, and the default route dies, this router may still know how to send the traffic this way. And this router certainly knows how to send it back this way. The Cisco symbol for router is like a can of tuna with a bunch of arrows on top of it. But frankly, that just looks like a really confusing router. I like to draw it with just an arrow in the direction of wherever the default route is. And I guess if it's a, if it's like a backbone router that has no default route, then we can just put all the arrows there and make it all fucking willy-nilly like a compass rose. Compass what? Another awesome reason why we use routers is that they can protect us. If a router is making decisions about all of the packets, all of the pieces of data that go through it, then it can drop or block some of them. So we can protect our house from random things coming from the internet. If we're in a school, organization, a hospital, military government with protected segments, we can put routers in front of them that know which things are allowed in, which things are not, and those are called firewalls. And I'll draw those as a router on fire, motherfucker. Another feature of routers that we won't go into much today, but I'm sure you're aware of it, is when you have many, many, many clients in a private network and you want to have them use a single public address. Internet addresses have a monetary value because there's only so many of them, at least in the version we're using today. And this allows you to save money by using a single address for many, many computers. It also obfuscates the internal address of where traffic is coming from, so it acts as a layer of privacy. And it also kind of acts as a de facto firewall because if something comes in from the internet looking for this and the router doesn't know who is talking to it, it just kind of drops it, so it kind of acts as a de facto inbound firewall. So that takes us into addressing. Um... I mentioned that MAC addresses within your network are kind of like nicknames in your house. Well, an IP address is kind of like the address of your house. Actually, it's more like your phone number because it's assigned to you by an authority and it's numbered in logical groups. Now, I mentioned the whole internet participates in IP. IP is kind of like UPS. It's there to just deliver whatever the fuck it is that's inside there. It doesn't need to know what it is. It, it probably shouldn't know what it is. It doesn't care what it is. It just looks at the label and sends it on. So how does it work? Well, you take data, any data, and you affix a waybill. You know, when, when you ship a package, you gotta fill out that little slip. Well, actually, here it's called a header. Um, but yeah, you, you, you affix a... a so this is the form that we fill out when we want to send something across the internet to somewhere else. No matter what it is, we can put pretty much anything we want down here, but up here is the form that we have to fill out so that the routers know what the fuck to do. So we're going to start with the version number. The IP version we're dealing with today is 4. Internet header length is going to be 5. I'll explain that in a second. Type of service is going to be 0 for now. Each one of these uh, quarter of the packet here is, is a byte, so each one of these uh, squares is a bit basically so this is a nibble so that's one hexadecimal character we'll calculate the length later IPID can be pretty much anything um, it just has to be relatively unique I'm gonna use the word beef in here because you can write that in hex fragment offsets gonna be zero we're not gonna set any of those flags today TTL I'll talk about in a little bit basically it's how many routers this uh, packet can go through before it gets dropped and we'll figure out why we want to do that in a little bit but I'm just gonna put 32 in here um, protocol is gonna be well right now we're just gonna make up our own protocol so I'm just gonna put zero later on we're gonna take advantage of some other shit and we'll write something in there. Header check some we'll get to. And source address is gonna be my IP address. So I'm 10.1.10.15 and I'm gonna send it to 10.1.10.15. 
40 hex. Now down here, I'm gonna write a message. So I'm gonna say, hello, that's a space, world, dot. There we go, and it's kind of messy, but it's okay, because this part down here is only used for our purposes. The router pretty much just deals with the shit that's up here. So while we're here real quick, the internet header length is how many 32-bit words the header's made up of, which is how many lines, basically. One, two, three, four, five. If we wanted to add options, we can. Um, we're not going to, but we would make the header longer here. The total length is the header size times the payload length. The payload length is 13, the header size is 20, so it's 33, so that's hexadecimal 21, and it's a big field, so we get two bytes. I don't give a shit about calculating the header checksum for this example, so I'm just gonna put some random shit in here. Just know that that's gotta be correct, or else the router is gonna drop it. Now, we're not done. Before we send this, first of all, we have to put this on a substrate, so let me get, um, my glue stick out here and put this right here. Now just like the UPS waybill is only useful to the UPS guy that may come up and pick up your packages, this IP header is only useful to things that speak IP like routers. So we gotta get this out the door and over to the router. So we could use a bunch of technologies, if this was the 90s we might use Apple Talk, we might use Token Ring. Today we're gonna use Ethernet and we're gonna plaster on an Ethernet header here. All right, that's the Mac of my router, and uh, I gotta send it from my source address, which is my computer. This is the source address of my NIC card. And the ether type basically says, hey, what's inside this uh, frame? And in this case, it's an IP packet. So we're gonna do 0800, which is the industry standard number for IP version four inside of an ethernet. It's the ether type. It literally says it right there, it's ether type. That's so fucking cute, isn't it? Anyway, what we've done right here is the first of many examples of encapsulation. We've made something a different type of thing by putting it inside of there. The first device we're going to send it to is pretty much only going to read this part of it, and it's going to forward everything on. The router is going to read off this part and this part, modify this part, send it on. The next router is going to keep going. So anyway, enough hoopla, let's send this out the fucking door. So we send that out, and this is what comes back. Now, real quick, in reality, this gap here and this crossed out option section would just be flat and there wouldn't be any bytes there. It would just go right from here to here. The first thing to notice is that the we have an ethernet header because it came back from our router. So this is just the reverse order of the addresses here. It's still ether type uh, 0800, which is IP. So now that we know that the next part of it is to be treated as an IP packet, just because it's white here doesn't mean that there's anything intrinsically that tells you it's an IP packet. Like, you've got to know from the previous context that you're going to interpret that, you know, it just starts out with a 4. You can't just start interpreting everything you get with a 4 as, you know, an IPv4 packet. So first of all, let's see what we can recognize. Now down here is my hello world. So this is, well actually, it's hello whoa. So the first 8 bytes of my message wound up, actually this is my original header here. So the pink stuff was modified on the way out. Now if you notice here, when I sent my packet, I had a TTL of 20, 20, which is 32 hex. And if you notice here, it's 12 now, and that's because every router that sent my original packet to wherever it got to decremented that by one. Now, this ultimately wound up at a router that couldn't route it, because I just made up a fucking IP address. So this is like a return to sender. This this top part here is the is what the post officer, in other words, the router that rejected my message. This is the IP header sending back to me. So this is where it came from. This came from 10.1.10.1, which is probably the router that controls the network that I made the IP address up on. And it's coming back to me, because I'm the one that sent the original message. And the protocol here, I, I sent the original message on protocol zero because I just made one up, but uh, protocol one is ICMP, which is Internet Control Message Protocol, and it's kind of like the return to sender uh, protocol. It's, it's where error messages from the internet come from. It's also how we do ping and trace route, but ignore that for now. This yellow thing here is the ICMP header. It's what immediately follows the IP header, so I can pretty much just take the take the message as being this part right here. So now this is the message that dropped off of, of my IP header. So I've taken the IP header off, and that's called decapsulation. Now what ICMP message one code zero tells me is that the network was unreachable. And what it does is it appends 
the the header and the first eight bytes of the originating packet that that caused the error and that way when I get this back my computer my operating system can figure out who it was you know because it could be a multiple application sending data figure out who on that computer it was that sent the errant packet and it sends them a message and that message looks much like this what happens if we put too much stuff in the truck too much stuff to fit and we, and we tell it to go down a road that that can't handle a truck that way you know let's say we put four tons of information in there four megabytes and we sound we send it down a road that can only handle for example 1500 bytes what happens by the way this is called the mt the maximum transmission unit it's the biggest chunk of data you can send over some type of physical network so for wired ethernet 1500 is a typical mtu so keep in mind what this means is that when we stuck our ethernet header onto something only the first 1500 bytes are going to be considered part of that frame and moved along with the equipment if there's anything over that it's just going to get left off so it's important to make sure that our ip frame doesn't get truncated because if it gets to the other end and this total length doesn't actually match what's there and there's not enough data for the router or the system on the other end is going to throw it away if we have an original packet let's say it goes from zero to two two zero in size and let's say our maximum fragment size is one zero zero hex or in other words 256 well it will fragment it into three fragments one that goes from zero to FF, one that goes from 100 to 1FF, and one that goes from 200 to 220. And these will be the fragment offsets on each packet. The first one and the second one will have the more fragments bit set, indicating there's more to come. There's also a bit here called don't fragment. And if we set the don't fragment flag, and we send a packet that's too large and it has to be fragmented, the router will simply drop it and send us back an ICMP. Potentially, if they're nice. Not all routers send these beautiful... This here is the actual message that comes back, type 1, code 4, when you try to send something that is too big and you tell it not to fragment. While we're here real quick, a um, couple things about ICMP. If you ever send a ping to someone, if you ever ping them, this is a, what a ping request looks like. This is what your computer sends out to whatever IP address you're pinging. And when they reply, if they reply, that looks like this, zero, zero. That is a ping response or an echo response. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gluing these down properly. Let me take care of that. And one last thing before we stop talking about ICMP altogether. Remember that I said that the TTL is how many routers the packet can go through. Let's, let's talk about why that might be. If you have a network full of routers and they're in a mesh and they're all autonomous, it's very possible that due to flaws in routing logic or human error, your packet may actually just traverse the network in a loop indefinitely. And that's where the TTL comes from. Every time your packet goes through the router, that TTL value gets decremented. Your router actually slaps on a brand new header and it decrements that TTL value. If it was 20, now it's 19. And if a router finally gets the packet and the TTL is zero, well then it drops it. And you guessed it, it sends out an ICMP message, type 11 code zero, which is TTL exceeded. Okay. So about 10 minutes ago, I discussed that we represent the internet or the rest of the internet as a cloud because we don't want to have to draw out or enumerate what's inside of it. The internet is relative, so what's inside your cloud is not necessarily what's inside everyone else's cloud. You may have heard of a program called Trace Route. It's actually called Trace Route in Unix, but Windows calls it Trace Ert. Trace Route basically lists out all of the routers between you and some target. If you've never done this before, open a command prompt, type trace route or trace RT if you're in Windows, and anything, Google, Yahoo, your mom's IP, whatever, and just sit there and watch, and it's pretty interesting. So if we want to find out what's inside of our cloud that we're connected to, all we got to do is send a packet with a TTL of one and see whoever the first person is that drops it for the TTL being too low, because they're going to send us back a type 11 message saying TTL expired. And then we send one with a TTL of two, and it gets two routers down. They drop it, and they send me back an ICMP. All we gotta do is just keep sending packets with increasing TTLs and wait for the messages to come back. Every time the message comes back, it has a header attached so we know what IP address it came from, so we know what the IP of that router is, and we can map out the trail as we go along. Now, if you think about it, on a modern computer, you have multiple applications all sending and receiving packets, potentially to the same source and destination. So how is it that when you're sending these packets, you're sending a stream of data, essentially, the operating system is able to break it up and deliver it to applications? Well, that's where things like UDP come into play. So UDP looks like this. UDP is protocol 17, and all it does is provide a source and a destination port. The port number is just an arbitrary identifier that tells the operating system how to route the packet, which process to route it to, and whether it's part of a socket or a stream of packets, or in this case they're called datagrams. What's some good UDP? Oh, DNS is some good UDP. One thing that uses UDP is DNS, which is port 53, but ironically the uh, hex for that is 3.5. Um, and we can choose any source port, this is just how the operating system ties it back to whatever client it is. We'll do 1, 2, 3, 4. DNS packet is really simple, it's it's uh, some numbers, it's some transaction IDs, so we'll do 0, 0, 0, 1, and then number of queries, number of responses. Now the way DNS represents names, you put the length first, and then the actual ASCII after it. So in this case we're going to do turds, that's 0, 5, and then dot biz, so instead of the dot you actually do the length of the next 
segment of the name. And then when you're out of things, because it actually turns dot biz dot because all domains. Watch my DNS video. We calculate the length up here. It's probably one two three four five twenty two. So in hex that's what sixteen a. I don't know. We're just gonna put like one a. It's good enough. We'll pad it out with some zeros. It's the internet. It doesn't really matter that much. Compute some checksum, and we're good. That's how UDP works. So that just lets you use multiple applications. Just adds another processing step to the pile so that the computer can take this part off and figure out what, what, what process it goes to. So that's UDP. It stands for User Datagram Protocol. This is a datagram, and the U as in user basically means the user on that system. If this was a big Unix mainframe back in the day, the <laughs> user would be which user is sending uh, traffic on the internet. So UDP is great, but there's still four main problems that we haven't solved yet. Number one, did it get there? Number two, is it all there? Number three, is it in the right order? And number four, are you ready for me to send you data? The internet's an unreliable medium. If you send a packet, it may not get to its intended destination. It may not get to its intended destination in the right order. It may be missing, it might be truncated, um, or the destination may not be listening for it. It may just go discarded. With UDP, when you send something to a port number, either an application is there listening or it's not. There's no acknowledgement sent of any packet, so you never know if anything was received, if it got there, unless you do that type of thing in your own protocol, create another layer on the stack put another truck in the fucking dolly. UDP is what's called a connectionless protocol, and TCP is stateful. What happens with TCP is your server application starts listening on port numbers, creates what are called sockets. The server that's listening on whatever arbitrary port number gets a request and can decide if it wants to accept the socket connection or refuse it. If it accepts it, a socket is created, and the server can go back to listening on the same port number and accept more connections. Multiple systems on the network each have their own set of port numbers and can connect outbound to the same systems, creating a gigantic client server model. If you want to send something certified, like fucking DHL with the little sash, the, the little thing that you rip open with the signature, if you want the guy to come to your fucking door with the tablet, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the tablet with the stylus, you want TCP. So let's take a look at what TCP entails. It's a big fucking monster here. All right, so we have the good old port numbers, source port, destination port, we'll use port 80. Yeah. What the fuck is that in hex, honey? Port, no port 80. It's port 80, so in hex that's 50. So this is where TCP gets really awesome. There's a sequence number and an acknowledgement number. With TCP, before you send data, you first open up a connection by synchronizing your sequence numbers. You can make up any sequence number. You can start at zero. It's probably best to make up a random one because otherwise people can't easily impersonate you. Then that would be fucking horrible. Let's say 400. And every packet also has an acknowledgement number, which is like the first number you're expecting. And in the first packet, it's always zero because we don't know what their sequence numbers look like yet. And if the server is listening on this port and they decide to accept our connection, I mean, they could refuse it, but let's say they decide to accept it, they send back a synchronize and acknowledge packet because they're both synchronizing their numbers. Let's say they begin with 600 and they're acknowledging our number and in fact they're gonna say that they acknowledge up to 401 which is the next number they expect from us here's sequence number 401 we're expecting 601 and uh, acknowledge and this is what's called the three-way handshake or in other words connecting let's say we send packet 7 and we're expecting packet 10 and we receive packet 10 and they're expecting packet 8 but our packet 8 gets lost and we were expecting 11 from them part of tcp is that we're always expecting an acknowledgement so after a while of not receiving an acknowledgement we'll probably just proactively send 8 again or if B has some data to send us, let's say they have packet number 11 that we were expecting. We're gonna notice that they're still expecting packet 8 and we're gonna resend packet 8, now expecting packet 12 from them. On top of that, I've oversimplified because the sequence numbers don't just increment, they increment by the length of the packet. So that accounts along with the checksum for the integrity of the packet, making sure all of it is there. You know what I'm saying? So real quick, let's talk about the various flags in the TCP packet. The first is reset, which basically means go away, I don't know what you're talking about. And this is sent anytime you send traffic to a port number that the operating system just wasn't listening on, or it wasn't talking to you, you hadn't done a three-way handshake with it. And this is important because if you think about it, after a computer crashes and reboots, it's in a state where it doesn't know about any of the previous connections, and it's still gonna be receiving data on those sockets. So this is the normal response, and the recipient of a reset message basically just has to go away. If you've ever seen the message connection reset by peer, that means your computer, or your TCP stack rather, received a reset flag in the middle of an active stream. 
Because this causes the computers to just go away and shut the fuck up, some firewalls like to send this when they don't want you to uh, communicate on a certain porter after a certain amount of time. <laughs> fin is the opposite of sin, it's finish. It's what you send at the end of the conversation when you want to close the stream. Just like with the sin packet, each side gets to close its half independently when it's done sending the last of its data. Just like how at the end of a telephone conversation, one of you is going to hang up before the other. In a TCP conversation, one of you will send the fin packet and close out your data stream before the other one is done. We talked about sin, it is to synchronize, it is the first message, it is... The act flag is set in any packet in which the acknowledge number is acknowledging the sequence number of a received packet. The push flag is usually sent at the end of a chunk to indicate to the operating system to send the buffer out to the application. And there's urgent and a few other ones that don't really uh, matter for this discussion. And then as you'd expect, your data just goes in this data payload section and you slap some more data in there. And then you can nestle some other protocols in there if you want. If you want to encrypt your data, this right here can be the start of a TLS hello message, uh, which basically says, hey, we're going to talk secret. And that's how you get your beautiful lock icon on your fucking data. So when we write application layer data, the data that, you know, presumably the application we're using would like to send, make sense of it, you know, in this case a web request. As we discussed, it gets boxed, it gets encapsulated. So this is the HTTP that's going to go inside of the TCP. It's an HTTP message, it's a request, is what we call that. And it's going to go inside of a TCP datagram because we want to guarantee that it gets there safe and intact and it gets to the right place on that system. And that gets wrapped in a IP packet. IP packet. Um, and that packet may become fragmented into one or more IP fragments. And as we discussed, those fragments then get broken up, encapsulated, or further fragmented into, our case, Ethernet frames. And that's not all. You know, when you use HTTPS, when you go to PayPal, you have that lock icon, you're putting TLS inside there. There's other intermediaries. And if you're using all of this, if you're using all of this over your corporate VPN, well, guess what? That's, fuck is it? We'll put that inside of a ESP, put that inside of IPsec, and put that inside of more IP. And more, you know, actually, technically, if we were tunneling, the Ethernet wouldn't be in there, but I'll uh, fuck it. We're getting creative, you know. I could just do this in MS Paint, but... Please do not throw sausage pizza away. Just don't. Like, all good acronyms, you remember it in reverse. No, it actually... The reason you remember it in this direction is because this is layer one, two, three. It's the way the whole layer metaphor fucking works. If apparently there's gravity and the protocols need something to stand on, so, you know, you have to start with physical, because if there's not something in the real world, you're fucking crazy and you're just talking to yourself, so. It's how we quantize the actual information. It's basically how we IRL. And layer two is called the data link layer, and it's how we form frames. You remember frames, the, the tiniest particles you can send on a network. In all of our examples, we've used Ethernet, and Ethernet occupies both of these spots. The Ethernet standard not only defines how we form the frames, how we actually made the header that tells the switching equipment where to send the traffic, but it also defines the physical element, how we actually encode that electrically, the preamble and the wave, quantization. Remember, this is where we were working with MAC addresses and local area networks. Layer 3 is the network layer. It's how we address globally. We've been using IP here. Both TCP and UDP are transport protocols. In other words, how we control the data stream. Because remember, without port numbers, without flags, it's just a stream of data coming from whatever address is sending data to you. Let's jump to layer seven because there's always gonna be a layer seven. This is your application layer data. In our case, it was the HTTP. This is ultimately the data that you're looking to get through the wire. Everything else is just overhead to make sure it gets there intact, safe, secure, confidential, integral, whatever. This is the actual stuff that you're intending to send. Now there's a couple layers in between here and these are optional. In fact, they're all optional because transport is even optional. Remember when we were sending ICMP traffic? Well, you could argue ICMP is a transport protocol, but it also can be an application protocol, depending on what you're using it for. If you're using the ping command, ICMP is the actual payload that you're sending out. So. You know, but either way, um, session protocols are how to form sessions. TLS would be a good example. TLS is what gives HTTPS its security and its cute little padlock, and it forms sessions that are encrypted with the session key. And P is for presentation. That's fucking bullshit. Piss poor. Piss poor performance. 
Now, the reason I went over this last is because I don't think most people that learn the OSI model even really understand encapsulation at the time they're understanding the OSI model. Most people see this and they're like, oh my god, first of all, look at all these protocols, but second of all, I don't understand this, why would we ever use more than one protocol at once? And unless you see it side by side like this, where you see that TCP and UDP are interchangeable, but only on that layer, and only because they provide a specific function that fits right there in between the routing and the session management, then it's really difficult. That is the conclusion of my video. There's so much more I could have touched upon, but I didn't want the video to be any longer than it had to be. I'm sorry it's even this long. If you didn't find my video helpful, the states of Oregon and Washington allow you to kill yourself legally, and I'll sponsor that effort, that endeavor, because I'm sure someone has to, you know, sign off and say that you're not nuts. I'll tell him you're not nuts.